attention. Joshu <clears throat> addressed his assembly and said, The supreme way is not difficult. It simply dislikes choosing. With even a few words, there will be delusion or enlightenment. This old monk does not dwell in enlightenment. Can you value this without reservation? A monk stepped forward and said, If you do not dwell in enlightenment, how can you value it without reservation? Joshu said, I don't know that either. The monk said, If your reverence does not know, how can you say that you do not dwell in enlightenment? Joshu said, Your questions are well asked. Make your bows and retire. Yes, my notes are still there. So, um, this is supposed to take me 19.2 minutes, according to my earlier calculations. So, I hope you've cleared the next hour and a half. <laughs> uh, so, the koan that I've just read out, the central figure is Joshu, who was one of the, one of the big names in Zen uh, from very early on. He was born in... Uh, in 778 uh, in China, uh, Zhao Zhu Gongshen. Um, and around that period, there was a fantastic flowering of, of Zen practice. Uh, and this is kind of the end of the Tang dynasty. His master was uh, Nan Sen, famous cat chopper in Hafer, you know, that dude. And uh, Nan Sen's teacher uh, was Ma Zhu. And so this is a, you know, a lineage of, of big names. Sadly, about three generations after Zhou Shu, in a time of a lot of bitter rivalry and strife and civil war, uh, this lineage dies out. And uh, it's not transmitted down to today. Except, of course it is, in the, in the Khans that have been collected in the interceding kind of 1400 years or so. And Zhou Shu figures really quite heavily in, the, in these Khans. And the two kind of main collections that, that we're familiar with, uh, um, the Mumon Khan and the Hekigan Raku. Joshu features in 17 different Khans. Um, and uh, by all accounts, he was a pretty fantastic guy. He uh, started practice quite early. He was 18 or so. Um, and uh, he uh, met um, Nan Sen, uh, his teacher, and, uh, and asked him, what is the way? You know, or kind of in everyday English, what's, what's it all about? What is the way? What's this special, amazing thing? And Nansen said, ordinary mind is the way. Just ordinary mind is the way. And Joshua said, how should I seek it? And Nansen said, if you look for it, you're already going in the wrong direction. Joshua said, if I don't seek it, however will I know what the way is? And Nansen <coughs> said, the way is not knowing or not knowing. Not knowing or not not knowing. Eh? Uh, knowing is delusion. Not knowing is indifference. When you've truly reached the way beyond doubt, you'll find it vast and boundless as space. How can it be talked about in terms of right and wrong? All of these stories end with the same thing. Joshua was immediately enlightened. But it carries on and says, his mind was like the clear moon, which I think is wonderful. And Joshua was known for being very direct. He didn't like to muck around with word games. He didn't like to uh, get caught in intellectual debates and what have you. And uh, time and time again when monks, because you know, monks would travel around and kind of put themselves against the great masters of the day. And Joshua was one of the big names, you know. One said to him, who is Joshua? And he said, I'm just a peasant. You know, nothing else. He was just a guy from a poor family. Another says, please, Master Joshua, you must teach me. And Joshua says, you've arrived at the temple today. Yes. He says, were you given some porridge? And he goes, yes. And he goes, 
wash your bowl. <laughs> yeah, so he's really direct, he doesn't muck around. What is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? That's a poncy question, you know. It's asking the same thing, but it's kind of adopting this discourse of let's play games with it, you know. And for Joshua, it was more important than that. And Joshua says, he looks out the window and he goes, the cypress tree in the garden, the rubber plant in the corner by the bogs, you know. That's what it was for Joshua. And in that sense, that absolute direct face-to-face encounter with, you know, whatever it is, has been passed down through these koans. And so I've been chatting with Joshua over the last four weeks on, on Session. And uh, this morning I was sitting in, uh, in Andy's lab, in, uh, in, in his treatment room, and I just had a real clear sense that it was time to kind of say thanks and cheers to Joshua. And it just immediately occurred, and he would have said, Nothing fancy. All right, all right, boss. Nothing fancy. We're fine. So I'm going to look at this con, and in a kind of unfancy way, what's, what's in this con? Joshua addressed his assembly. One of the very first things I got was this kind of sense that all of these things seem like a million years away, a million miles away, but actually, it's kind of right here, you know? So. Um, it's not exotic and alien, it's just like coming to Wednesday Night Zazen on the top floor of 13 Hope Street, right? So Joshu addresses his assembly. They've probably had tea and bickies and what have you, and it's time for that to happen. So Joshu sits there and he picks up the thing and he goes, Hey Andy, is this thing really working? You know? And someone says, Hey Joshu, are you hearing aid in? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And he gives his talk. The supreme way is not difficult, it simply dislikes choosing. So often this happens, the talks start with a text, right? And Josh is doing exactly the same thing here. This is the, these are the first two lines of a a, a Chinese poem from about 200 years previously, which is known as the Xin Xin Ming, uh, or the verses of the faith mind. Yeah, these translations are always a bit iffy. It was a attributed to the third Chinese ancestor of, of, Zaz, of, of, of Chan of Zen um, and it would have been really well known. Everybody would have known this and this first line would have been known by absolutely everybody, everybody in the room. He actually quotes this particular line in four of those 17 koans. So this is obviously a text he comes back to time and time again. So the line is the supreme way is not difficult, it simply dislikes choosing. Or in other renditions, uh, it avoids picking and choosing. So, you know, week three, I pick up um, Zaza from the station, and she says, anything you don't like? You know, asking me about food. And it's, oh, I'm picking and choosing. Oh, but I'll give her an answer. I don't like peas. (laughs) Bugger, it was pea soup that night, you know. (laughs) That's fine. Um, So the sense of this, of this disliking choosing, you know, this great way, this supreme way, is a realm in which right and wrong, good and bad, black and white, you know, they all fall away. This is, this is the absolute. And it's kind of a very traditional expression of it. This would have been, you know, very familiar to the people that he was talking about. And it's the same sort of thing that we read about in loads of books from contemporary teachers today. That this, the realm of the absolute, of big mind, of your original face, or all of these ways that we have of pointing to it because it's beyond words, is beyond concepts. If you pick one, you miss the other. This day to day realm is the realm of the relative. This is the day to day realm in which we do jobs and we pay taxes and we moan about Trump and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. In the absolute, it's already perfect. And then he goes on, he says, with even a few words, there is delusion and enlightenment. And actually, at this point, he's kind of turning it on its head. Because that's supposed to be enlightenment, right? He's saying, hang on, even our, our notions of enlightenment separate it from delusion. As soon as we start to try and think about it, to talk about it, conceptualize it, we get caught up in ourselves. There's kind of no way around it. It's just another, it's just another dualism. What is the absolute what is the supreme way as soon as you open your mouth you've shot yourself in the foot
I like that music. I will pick and choose it. This old monk does not dwell in enlightenment. Um, in one sense, he's just, you know, he's avoiding saying me, and that's fine. But actually, just like when he says, I'm just a peasant, or whatever, he's just saying, this old monk. And remember, some of these monks would have traveled thousands, hundreds anyway, of miles to go and visit him, to sit with him, to visit, visit his temple and what have you. And they're expecting this great master. And he keeps on saying, no, just an old guy in fancy clothes that somebody else made. I do not dwell in enlightenment. And it's a funny phrase, that dwell in enlightenment. You can kind of hear him. I don't know if they had air quotes in the Tang dynasty, but if they had, I think he might have gone, this old monk does not dwell in enlightenment. You know? Get your head out of your bum. Stop making up these fantastic, groovy, romanticized ideals for it. I don't dwell in enlightenment. <laughs> the great Zen master of the 20th century, baseball player Yogi Berra, said, when you reach a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> <laughs> You have to pick and choose. Of course we have to pick and choose, but we don't get stuck in it. We move freely between the realm of the absolute and the realm of the relative, and we do what's required. Every moment presents itself to us, and we just act freely and appropriately. And sometimes the answer might be to hold up a fist or a finger or, you know, that finger, maybe. And sometimes it's, I love banjo music, you know? Liverpool was beautiful today. It was fantastic. Can you value this without reservation? I'm not stuck on this for a while. Look, in the face of it, he's saying, do you get me? But like, do you properly, properly get me? Don't understand me and write an essay about it. You know, do you properly, in your gut, in your dandien, in your hara. Do you experientially get what I'm on about? But actually, the kind of reading that really opened this up for me was not do you get it, but can you value this right here, right now, whatever's in front of you? Can you really open up to your own life Whatever it is, to sitting in front of people in funny clothes, hoping that I don't go too far over 20 minutes, you know, to a fantastic morning overlooking the thin mists of the, of the valley and the soft hiss of the M6, to being told that someone you love has died, to being bankrupt, sick, can you value this totally as your life and really be in the middle of it, not stuck in ideas about enlightenment, not stuck in fancy robes and what have you, really can you do that? And in a sense, the koan could have just ended there because there's the message. But the guy, I don't think we know who properly collected all of these, but he was merciful. And whoever it was that was running the digital voice recorder in Joshu's temple that night didn't turn it off. And they recorded some of the questions. And we got a few of them have been passed down as well. So, a monk stepped forward and said, which monk? What monk? Was this the sort of monk that everyone goes, Jesus, Alistair asks a question every bloody week, you know. Is he showing off again? Or is this somebody who's been on the rack about it? You know, and really freaking out about their practice and really hair on fire. We don't know. And in fact, reading this, I kind of get both sides of this. You know, I've projected a lot onto this koan. Um, and I kind of come up with two characters. Ernest Ernie and Arrogant Aaron. Ernest Ernie. Ernie is that, you know, 
hair on fire guy. He's really freaked out. He's probably not terribly self-confident, whereas Arrogant's a bit of a know-it-all, a bit of a loud mouth, a bit of a show-off. Um, and you can kind of read this dialogue as if either of them was giving it. So, when Ernie says, but hang on, if you don't dwell in enlightenment, how can you value it? He's really asking, well, where is this? How can I do it? Can I help me here? You know, really, give me something. And Joshua's answer is, I don't know. I don't really have anything to give you, because what you're looking out for is right there. It's nothing other than your life already. God, that's hard to see. And for Aaron the Arrogant, he's saying, I think I've caught you. If you don't dwell in enlightenment, how can you value it, you know? Aaron's really stuck on this value of, uh, of this, this notion of enlightenment. Sadly, I see more of myself and Aaron than Ernie. But I do see both of them in me, you know. I, I, I do get both of them. But the trouble with both of them is they're stuck. They're stuck on this notion that there's something that they need to get other than the circumstances of their life as they already are. And Joshua's response, I don't know that either, gives them nothing to hang on to. It's a really clever response. Their not knowing is a not knowing of desperation or a not knowing of not having the right book or whatever. But Joshua's not knowing is, it's vast and it's expansive and it's receptive. And it's the not knowing of just being open to whatever arises. That's proper not knowing. The monk said, they still don't get it, right? I wrote here, can't he just leave it alone? <laughs> Ernie's still stuck as in, in his insecurity. Aaron thinks he's found another chink in Joshua's armor he's about to show off, you know? But if we're not open to that sort of not knowing that is open-hearted and receptive we're always going to feel that something's lacking. There's never going to be an answer that we're going to be satisfied with until we just fully sit in our lives. If your reverence does not know, I think Aaron here is being a bit sarky, you know? Your reverence. What's that about? Ernie's kind of almost begging. Please, your reverence, you know, anything. How can you say you do not dwell in enlightenment? Aaron's big finale. I've got you. Ha <laughs> ha. Got one over on you. Um, Ernie's still just desperate. He's saying, what on earth do I need to do to convince you to give me a word of truth? Please, sensei, just let me know what I'm supposed to know. You know? And what's his response? Your questions are well asked. They're still, he's not giving them an inch. Because, of course, it's all right here. When I first read this, it seemed like one of those kind of zen things, you know. Your questions are, are well asked. If there had been another Zen teacher, it would have been, you know, sod off. I'm done with you. I'm finished. I'm bored. Get lost. You're a poser or whatever it is. But I think Josh is a lot more direct and honest and, frankly, compassionate than that. I think he's saying, really, it's great. You're asking questions. Keep doing that. Keep asking questions. Never stop. It's endless because it keeps arising in every moment. And then he says, make your bows and retire. Kind of an odd thing. You know, in a formal sense like this, make your bows and retire. But why has that stayed in the car and why has it stayed as the teaching? As, as what, what are we supposed to get out of that? And part of it for me is... Make your bows acknowledges that we're doing this in a really wonderful, rich tradition. And I'm about to take the shippe handed to me by sensei, handed to him by Roshi, Roshi, teacher, onwards, you know. And uh, there's a wonderful richness in this tradition. But, of course, it's only ever pointing at our own lives. Now, there's a lot of nonsense we can get caught up in, but... Make your bows and retire. Not go away, but get back to your place. 
in the Zen though, in your life, in your job, in your family, really find that big fantastic truth, whatever it is that got you under the cushion in the first place, find it in your own life. It isn't anywhere else. Whoever we are, Aaron, Ernie, Jim or Bob, you know, we start right here. We might be drawn into the Zendo by our desperation or our curiosity or our intellectual pretentiousness or whatever, where, whatever it is that brings us here. But fundamentally, we only stand in our own shoes. That's all we've got. And that's all I've got.